Hey everybody, welcome back to Design Cinema. This is Feng Zhu speaking, and we are now at part two of the Cyberpunk Bar. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed the return of Design Cinema. Uh, seems like the uh, response so far have been really good. So I gotta thank you guys for all the support and the patience for us being uh, gone for so long. And it seems like a lot of you guys are enjoying the real-time format. It definitely makes it much easier for me to record them. So, uh, so yeah, let's continue this episode. Uh, so last week we... Uh, kind of block this whole thing out. And so what I'll do today is I'm gonna continue basically painting on top of it. Uh, now that we have a general idea of where we're going, I'm just gonna go in and just, uh, just yeah, we're doing this all in real time. So I'm just gonna go in and start designing this stuff out. Um, first thing I do is kind of just remind myself where I was prior to stopping this recording. So I'm just gonna check some of my layers because it's been about three, four days since I last seen this image, maybe five days now. Okay, so we have our grid here. We have our little rough drawing, which I don't need really at this point. Uh, we have the other grid. We have this one. And uh, today, since I'll be kind of just painting things, I'll be blabbering about random things about the industry. Maybe I'll try to get to some of your questions. I looked through the YouTube comments just briefly. Uh, normally, I don't have time to go through every uh, comment. Uh, I have my staff sometimes collect some of the um, questions and so forth. But before I started this recording, I went in and just saw a few, so I'll try to answer uh, some of the questions that I saw. But uh, give me a few seconds here as I um, refresh my memory of what the heck I was working on and what layer is what, because I'm probably going to collapse some of these layers down. All right. First thing, I thank you guys for uh, recommending this setting. Remember, I was complaining about this zoom lock, which I think on the PC doesn't do this by default. But on the Mac, it does. I'm not too sure. Um, I haven't used the PC Photoshop in quite a bit, uh, but uh, thank you guys for this little tip. Maybe uh, some of you guys will find it useful. You go to your preferences, you go to general, which right now is not being recorded, uh, it's off screen. But you get to your settings and just unclick zoom resizes windows. And thank you so much for this because, oh man, this is so much better uh, to be able to zoom without the window resizing. So uh, it's such a strange setting, but I guess maybe uh, uh, for photographers, it's probably something that's very useful. But when you're doing digital painting, you don't want the window to be zooming like that. Because what I like to do is I like to pan, especially in this mode and so forth, uh, the image. So to see and also see where the edge of the image is sometimes so uh, anyways so thank you guys again for this great tip um, for me I haven't upgraded my Photoshop in such a long time this is actually CS6 which I think is the probably the newest version of Photoshop uh, but for the longest time I just used whatever was installed on my computer um, it's like really old version so all these new settings I don't even know myself okay so, oh, I gotta stop smacking my lips there, picks it up on the mic. Uh, all these bad habits, when I get into design cinema, I will uh, remind myself not to do them. Okay, so let's see here. I'm gonna put my grids on top. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna collapse my layers. That's the base, remember this image here? Uh, we don't need that no more. That just eats up memory being there. So what I'll do is I'll get rid of the layer group. Put my grid on here. This grid, I think I'll still need. Line drawing, I don't think I really need it anymore. Let me see. So I'm going to get rid of this layer group here. Oh, let me track time. I didn't even track when I started this. It's been, what, three, four minutes? Okay, so we'll stop this somewhere around an hour from now. Okay, let's see, grid, grid, line drawing. I'll just keep this around for a little bit. Okay, this I'll keep. Okay. I don't think I actually need this one, but I will just keep it for now. All right, so the base one, I don't want to, I don't need that anymore. So I'm just going to go ahead and collapse that down. Let me save this. Uh, just to eat up less memory. And uh, hopefully the audio sounded okay. I checked it out briefly on YouTube. Seems like the hissing noise is not being picked up. But today my computer's uh, laptop is a little bit closer to the mic because last week it was really hard to paint with the laptop. My arms are like literally stretching out to try to reach the keyboard to you know minimize the, the fan recording. Uh, but like I mentioned, I'll try to solve that in the coming weeks or so by getting some uh, proper equipment set up uh, at this studio. Okay, let's go ahead and start painting. So. What I like to do sometimes before I get into high details and using photo textures and so forth is to block it in really roughly of where my ideas are. So this phase, sometimes I keep the design, sometimes I don't. Uh, what I want to do right now is just kind of freely open my imagination. Don't worry about things like fundamentals, even though fundamentals are super important. But I don't want anything to get in my way. I want to just design. I want to design completely in the open. I have an idea where this is at. Uh, you know, someone mentioned that this looks more like a strip club or something, which I sort of agree as well. So I want to change this to a little bit of a more bar, a little bit more clubby, uh, get it out from that, you know, look like a strip club or something. So um, 
I'm just gonna freeform design some stuff. I generally design maybe around here about this zoom level and let's just block stuff in. I'm gonna keep my grid on. I have no idea what this, this swervy line is. Uh, it doesn't matter at this phase, it's su super rough anyways. So I'm just gonna take a brush and uh, so right now I'm just gonna start painting. Yeah, and uh, I'll try to just talk about random things as I paint. Cause um, I mentioned this many, many times on Design Cinema. I like my brain to be a little bit at on a, uh, kind of automated mode during this phase because I want the experience to take over. The more I think about something like this, the stiffer I sometimes get with my designs. So I want to just be blabbering. Uh, my students who are, you know, a time in the past <laughs> will all know this, is that when I'm doing a demo, I talk a lot, probably sometimes too much, but it's not something I'm trying to do on purpose. It's some, actually, it is something I'm trying to do on purpose. Uh, sorry about that. I'm doing it to free my mind uh, because if I'm painting in a complete quiet space, I will actually mess up way more. Uh, it's kind of like riding a bicycle or something or remind yourself to breathe. You know, like next time you're on a, riding a bicycle, just remind yourself like, okay, push forward, make sure I'm balancing, push forward my pedal, make sure I'm balancing, make sure the handle's correct. I think the more you do that, you're probably gonna crash. Um, or like, you know, you see like, uh, if you're doing mountain biking, you see a tree in front of you, the more you think about like, don't crash into the tree, the most likely you'll crash into the tree. Or if you just naturally handle it, let your body handle it, you avoid the obstacles. So it's very similar, at least for me, when I'm doing concept designs, that. I'm thinking about it, but I'm also not thinking about it. So uh, if I think about it too much, I tend to mess up. So, um, so I'll talk about random things. Okay, let's see here. And I'm, if I'm working uh, by myself, you know, without teaching class, uh, I'll be listening to music or YouTube broadcasts or Let's Play videos, like something that causes noise, that's kind of white noise. I think some of you guys do that with my videos, actually. Uh, when you guys are working, you just have something in the background. So I have podcasts and all sorts of stuff on in the background. And then all that is to create a little bit of a distraction, purpose distraction for myself so I don't get too caught up in my work. So it sounds strange, but it's, it's kind of important. I can't work in a complete void. Okay. So with this new perspective grid in there, I can now check my foreshortening and all sorts of things, dealing with some fundamentals, and I'm just designing now. I'm fixing some of the uh, perspective grids to put stuff on grids. The cool thing about cities is that most cities are built on grids. Some buildings will be off. We don't want everything to be nine degrees because that will look kind of boring. Um, but majority of your stuff uh, in a metropolitan location is gonna be on some type of grid. Okay, paint. Let me see if I could get to some of the questions I remember. We didn't have too many technical questions. Uh, most of you guys are just saying uh, thank you for the return of Design Cinema, so which I appreciate greatly. Uh, it's you guys that I'm doing this for. Like I mentioned many times, man, if even one person benefits from these videos, then it makes it worthwhile for me to produce them. Um, just like our students who will go off and get jobs and so forth. There's a lot of work to train students to get them to the level that are able to get them a job, I guess, in the business. A lot of work, a lot of encouragements, uh, you know, a lot of planning on our end as well. But when that one student gets a job and uh, they write us an email telling us that they're finally in the business, that reward is worth way more than anything because it's really satisfying, very humbling as well to uh, see an individual uh, reach their goal in life, I guess. Okay, let's see, it's pain here. We just had a student recently, just a few days ago, got a job over at, uh, I don't know if I can mention it, probably can, <laughs> because uh, I think it's confirmed. Uh, we have actually a few students at the studio. It's uh, Telltale Games, which they make all those uh, Walking Dead and so forth. Uh, great studio, they make some pretty cool stuff. So uh, he just got a job over there. So we have some other students over there as well working on the Walking Dead series. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, it's a great news for, for us to hear. All right, let me continue paying. All right, anyways, what I was going to do, talk, answering questions, right? Uh, I'm, I saw someone answer a question regarding the brush, which we do get a lot. Uh, but since it's been such a long time since I made a design cinema, I will repeat some of this stuff that um, <clears throat> was probably asked before. But regarding brush, if you just learned to uh, paint in Photoshop, I still recommend trying the default because there's so many brushes in uh, out there. Like you go to DeviantArt, there's like so many brushes. And a lot of them are really good, but when there's too many things, that could also lead to confusion. So I just recommend using the default round brush, uh, even with default settings, and just use it for a while, get used to it. And then as you get used to it, then you start messing with brushes. I don't have too many brush, I have maybe five that I use regularly, which is this chalk brush you see here on screen. 
came with Photoshop, came with Photoshop like four. It's really old brush. I don't use any new brushes. I know the Photoshop has all those cool tilt brush and all these things. Um, I'm more like old school. I just use whatever works. And I'll explain a little bit that uh, leading to the next question, which I thought someone asked, you know, what's a cost of artist doing on set? Um, the thing is actually for the past almost of oh, three, three years now, I'm no longer a concept artist. I don't actually do drawings for a living anymore. Uh, these days, I'm more of a producer slash production designer um, on films. So I'm actually just using my expertise and experience to guide projects along, you know, get them made. Uh, my special area of focus is in pre-production pre and VFX. So what we're trying to do is work with directors who might not have done too much VFX work. And we start at a very early stage from a concept stage to advise them with production, right? on the budget they have and the dream uh, and the goal they want to achieve with their films and if we plan this out early enough through concept design and so forth we could then achieve the look they want within their budget because sometimes when you're dealing with vfx it could get very very expensive if you don't pre-design it well enough in the beginning um, and especially for directors who haven't done too much vfx work uh, you know because now you could do anything with cg it tends to be a double-edged sword because sometimes directors be like oh let's just solve that in cg it, yes we could solve it with cg but every <laughs> Everything you do costs money, right? Uh, you can only solve it to the amount of budget you're willing to spend. So yes, we could green screen everything. We could we could cut things out. We could lasso. We could you know add more atmosphere. We could do whatever. We could do anything. But if your budget is only a set amount, you're gonna eat up all your budget, uh, especially in places that are wasteful. It's like, do you really want to do this with CG? Where we could do a little bit of prepping in the beginning shoot this live action and save you probably half a million dollars. And that's generally what I do right now on my job. So I'm on set not as a concept artist, but as a producer, uh, watching over VFX studios. Like some of these films, we have like nine Hollywood studios involved. So it's a lot of different studios uh, we're overseeing. Uh, we also oversee previs. Uh, basically anything that makes the film look good, uh, that's my job. So I'm with a director pretty much uh, all the time <laughs> dealing with this stuff. So it's a lot of fun, but uh, it's not concept design. But that's where my career has taken me I for my for those who listen to design cinema uh, mentioned this also as uh, as well which is that I didn't get into this business because I want to be a concept artist I got into this business because I like films and games and I just took the progression of concept design as the way in but my true love is actually making things making a film making a game so getting in the uh, development part of it you know be really involved in in the scope of the work so um, you know concept design let me that for the past 20 years and now as a producer I get to be even more involved on the project which is a lot of fun for me all right let me see I'm gonna dump uh, I'm gonna dump some memory here to see uh, if you want to dump memory in Photoshop you just purge go to edit purge all and it will dump a bunch of memory I probably do that a lot since I'm recording and it slows the computer down uh, I'm already feeling the slowdown here uh, I just ordered another computer just for design cinema. Actually, it should be a pretty good rig. It's actually a gaming PC. I just ordered. Um, it's kind of you know like 1080 GTX and all that crazy stuff. 64 bit of RAM and all these uh, SSDs and so forth. Uh, I got that so I could record the uh, more smoothly design cinema without all these hiccups. This laptop, this uh, MacBook Pro, uh, can't really handle this. <clears throat> okay. And also, I'm recording. I can't run, run my second screen off this Mac. You'll just chug, chug the computer. So hopefully, the new PC will show up in about a day or two, and then uh, that's going to be a PC. So uh, we'll switch over to that one. Uh, get Photoshop up in there, and uh, we should be good to go. All right. So that should address the question of uh, being on set. Oh, there's a follow-up question, which is, like, can I take some photos? And unfortunately, that is not possible. Uh, these film sets are very, very, very secure. Uh, one, we don't want to leak the film. Two, there's a lot of uh, stars and so forth involved, and they don't want their photos leaked online. So there's no, there's no phones allowed, actually. Uh, of course, we could take photos for ourselves for documenting some of the shots and uh, work with VFX, but we can't publicly release anything. So, And that's just a common uh, thing in the, in the industry. If you want to work in this business, you have to be ready to to not share anything uh, even though this stuff is really fun and social media is such a inviting thing nowadays that I can imagine especially for younger kids that sharing is such a uh, common phenomenon that you want to share everything but uh, the entertainment industry especially the design industry it's a secret industry it's something you don't share you don't talk about what you're working on uh, until the clients are releasing it themselves right so um, yeah, these films we're working on, they're all like 2018, 2019 releases. So we can't, uh, we can't even talk about them. 
Okay. So as I talk, uh, I do have this on a layer. Okay, good. You can see what I've done so far is just building things up. It's actually pretty rough. Um, sometimes I keep these, sometimes I don't. So um, I just kind of block stuff in. I can even go looser than this just to block in. Let me take a brush in here and just kind of, I'll do really loose stuff here. But I want to talk about this loose. This loose is not sloppy loose. Okay. There's two different loose kind of paintings. There is sloppy, which you're just trying to do stuff fast as you can, but you're not being careful with it. That doesn't achieve much, at least for what I need to do here, right? Sometimes loose stuff without any kind of control is fun. I did mention that there's no fundamentals and so forth, but I'm not being sloppy. Sloppy is going in, just going, blah, just, you know, draw random lines, but that's not going to help anybody. So, what? Oh, my internet connection got disconnected. Okay, anyways, that shouldn't affect our recording here. Um, control loose is being loose, letting your body kind of and mind kind of freely design. But at the same time, I'm watching my lines carefully. I'm not drawing it perfectly, but I am watching everything I do so I don't create a giant mess. Because loose sloppy sometimes end up cleaning up more than you're actually helping. Right. It's a hard thing to do when you're beginning, if you're just starting to learn. Being loose and controlled is one of the hardest things to do, actually. I remember as a student uh, back in our center, that was so frustrating because I used to watch teachers draw as if like there's nothing going on. Right? They're just like totally chill, totally relaxed, and they're just working away. And you're like, how, how did they do that? You know, how can I paint like that? Um, it just comes from experience because they have such control of the medium. They make it look easy. Um, and then if you try to do it at their speed, you're like, this is impossible. So it's the same thing. So they're controlling their level of loose. If you're learning, be slow. The speed is not something to be proud of. It is something that us prof uh, professionals, we, are, we often talk about whenever we're together. It's like, what's up with the speed thing? You know, why, why is there a phenomenon going like speed painting, all that? It's, it's fun, yes, to do some of that stuff, but that's not how the world, I mean, that's not how we work. Um, we obviously are fast at what we do, but we don't use that as a, like, I did this in half an hour. You know, it's, it's not. It's, it's sometimes things take days to do. You know, big production paintings out of, out of Hollywood takes days, sometimes a week to do one single painting because of the demand that's in it. Um, maybe eventually we'll get to one of those for this episode or one of these shows. Okay. Pretty soon I'll have to turn off the grid. Let me, let me design this window out. Let's see. Trying to design a bus. That's kind of dumb. Let's see, that's kind of dumb too. Let's put a window here. That's not so good. I'm using lasso right now just to get some glass going. Let's see. And all this stuff I'll clean up, but before I clean up, I want to have a good design first or something that looks kind of entertaining. Okay, so let's make our club less strip club looking and more like bar looking. Oops. I can't see the keys. <laughs> I'm pressing the wrong button. Okay, let me see here. Because I have this huge microphone right in front of me and it's blocking the keyboard, so I'm kind of guessing with my uh, fingers where things are. Okay. I'll get a, um, I'll get a, whatchamacallit, what do you call those things that the lamp goes on, those little stands that you can put the mics on so it comes from overhead versus uh, on the table. We'll get that soon. So busy, now you guys see why I'm uh, really busy because I actually run two different companies. So we have the school, um, you know, obviously, uh, but I also have a film production company. So we also have a design wing as part of the studio. We have designers working uh, in two different locations actually on these films, pre-production. We have storyboard departments, we have a uh, light previous department. So, and then there's me who is a producer's uh, role. So I run around to different sets and, you know, directors, house or whatever, whatever that's needed to, uh, to get the show going. We even advise story, script, you know, whatever that's needed, uh, especially in the beginning when a script is just coming together because you can even use this time to control the budget without the, uh, destroying the creativity, right? Because for creative people, when you have a director or a writer, they want to do the best they can. But the reality of what a producer does is, okay, can you actually do this with the money you have? Or how can we help you achieve this with the budget you have? So, because not every film is your avatar, you know, not every film is $200 million budgets. So you have to, uh, you have to control the budget. 
And that's something that uh, I used to talk to my students about, uh, uh, you know, on Kickstarters and so forth. You see all these kind of uh, indie studios pop up and the failure rate of those are actually pretty high. If you actually look at how many comes through, I used to fund quite a bit of Kickstarters until most of them don't come through as I stopped doing that. Um, And the reason for it actually is sometimes the lack of producers because a lot of these guys that do Kickstarters, they come from big triple A's. A lot of them, you know, they used to work for EAs and all that and they want to leave the corporate type of it behind, right? And I could totally understand that. I worked in those industries for a long time as well. You know, the corporate, you know, a bunch of guys from Yale and Harvard, you know, telling you what to do for games and so forth. You get that. But then once you leave that behind and not become a producer yourself, you realize, oh, they're there for a reason. They're there to keep the project in line. They keep the budget in line. So obviously, sometimes they overstep their boundaries and get, get, you know, start to mess with creativity, but they have a role. That's why studios have them. Um, and when you take that out, for example, you start doing a Kickstarter, you're like, okay, we our, sh- our entire product is creative people only, right? Um, if they have experience dealing with budget and so forth, they do fine. But when you start dealing with a team that hasn't done too much production on their own, and you put them in a high expensive, you know, funded uh, venture, you could run into problems where they spend the money too fast, where they're not watching their um, time productions and so forth, and gets them in trouble, and they run out of money. So, and that's what a producer does. It's, it's going in there making sure that doesn't happen. Okay. Sometimes you get great results, sometimes you don't. So, uh, but of course, you could, the same thing could be said for, uh, for, for triple A's as well. So there's, there's no right or wrong in this thing, but producers are pretty important. You can't have people running around just being creative all the time. You have to control some of that. Okay. Okay. I've been sitting on both sides of the fence for a long time. Not fence, both sides of the job, wearing two hats, right? I do creative stuff and then I also do money stuff. Running the school, it's a business as well, right? You have to make sure that you have the teachers, you have the facilities, you have all the computers, you have the build outs, and that stuff is expensive. Uh, so we have to, uh, you know, wear two hats. Okay, let's see what am I done. This, what is this, a car? I don't know, let me flip the canvas. I'm starting to like where the club is going. Some, uh, but I need to fix some of the perspective here. I'm actually gonna lasso this guy here. Let me see if I can do a cheap, let me just collapse this guy. Copy and paste. Oops, wrong button, because I can't see my keyboard. Okay, let's see. I'm getting that heart to just warp into location. Let me, uh, what am I doing, a skew maybe? Because now that I have that perspective grid, I have to make sure all this stuff matches. So merge that. This guy here needs to come down way down. So it's on this grid, a little bit thinner. Okay, that's probably right. Because I'm looking at this grid right here, this grid that's going across. Let me switch to a different color. So that has to be in perspective. You can see it's still too high, so it needs to come down to about here, and it needs to foreshorten, which means that that loop needs to be shortened. Uh, that's better, delete that part out. It's close enough, that's close enough, all right. It's not perfect, we don't have to be perfect with this stuff, as long as we're okay, especially for these kind of rough concepts. So, but we're gonna just make sure they're okay. All right, paint some uh, cool things inside there. I'm going to put some geometry in here, like some cool signs and some octagons or something. Let me see. Let me try that. New layer. How do I make an octagon in Photoshop? I think I could use the... Where is that tool? This thing? Polygon tool? Oh, here we go. Okay, here's one. Rasterize the layer. So now I have this dude. Okay, so let's make a, let's make a couple of these suckers. <laughs> I did a bunch of these things for a film that's coming out. I think later this year, a Luc Besson film called Valerian. A lot of futuristic cities and so forth. It was a lot of fun. And Luke is a great guy. He's super nice, super talented. You know, when I was in school, I loved his uh, Fifth Element. So it was really fun to uh, to finally work with him in an IP that's kind of related actually to Fifth Element. I believe it's a similar world. I think it's the same world actually as as Fifth Element. But this one, this story takes place in the different location. 
Of course, I can't reveal it because I know there's a trailer, but I don't know, I don't know how much they have revealed, so I probably can't talk about it too much. Okay, but a lot of, lot of cool stuff, a lot of CDs and stuff, similar to what I'm doing here. Little cyberpunky. Okay, hope you guys are enjoying this real-time thing because it's quite fun for me. So this is almost exactly like how I teach, teach class. It's just talk and uh, blabber and the designs come out of them. Am I overdoing this? Okay, so there's that storefront. It's kind of ugly. Let's see. Maybe this guy goes here. It's got good. Okay, I'm going to merge these dudes. We got that sucker. We're going to select it. Actually, do I need to select it yet? Probably not. Okay, let's, let's make a clone of it just in case I need to use it elsewhere. Let's flip this guy. And we'll do this as a graphic. Put it in front here. I'm going to use my skew once more to get that into perspective. So our vertical, we have quite a bit of a camera here uh, in terms of uh, wide angle lens. So we're going to make sure that this shape is also within the same lens. That, that's about it. That does it. A little big. Let's shrink it down a bit. Shrink it down a little bit more. Okay, let me purge memory. Purge all. So this recording is quite fun because um, what I could do now is like whenever I have an hour, I just uh, record an episode for you guys uh, and then just hopefully I could do at least two or three. Someone mentioned like next episode airing in 2018. So I got a laugh out of that. But I totally get what you guys are saying. So I want to make sure we keep this going for a while and not uh, stop again. Okay. Because actually design cinema is quite fun for me to do. It's a break for my, for my work sometimes, even though right now my phone is probably going crazy. Yep, I'm looking at my phone. It's blinking with all sorts of messages. Uh, but it's okay. You know, I got I to gotta take some time to do these for you guys. So the director, actually, I probably need to check real quick. Sorry, so unprofessional. But you know, I'm not supposed to check phones, but uh, sometimes I get directors asking stuff. Uh, okay, it's probably okay. <laughs> all right. This is what you do when you're a producer. You get uh, calls all the time from VFX houses like, hey, where's this? Los Angeles needs this. You know, <laughs> Munich needs this and all sorts of studios. Okay, that's kind of cool. Highlight that. Okay. But when you guys get to my age, this is the kind of stuff, you know, you'll be wanting to do as well. Depending on what you want to do, you know, some of my friends, they want to stay as a concept artist and just design uh, for their career. For me, I just love to be involved in production. I like to be on set and, you know, look at the sets being lit and work with cinematographers. And that, that's where it gets me going for what I like to do. So concept design is just part of it, but I actually love the... the uh, the coming together part where you just you look at the camera, it's all set up and you look at that first shot, you're like, oh man, this is awesome. You know, everything we did for the past six months is now uh, showing up on screen and it's going to get shot and this is how it looks. It's great. And then, then you go into VFX uh, with the soups and then you see them start to composite some of the uh, VFX stuff in there. It's amazing to see all that stuff come together. To think that maybe uh, half a year ago, it used to be a piece of concept design uh, in Photoshop and now it's, it's this realized thing. Uh, it's quite amazing. Okay. So there's that. Our Valentine's heart is getting reduced in his read. But like we mentioned uh, before, the goal here is to make this the first read. All right, so this is a video game or a film. Uh, the gamer knows what to, what to do, where to go, hopefully. O open world games are, are not exactly open. I mean, they're open world. I guess the way to do it is that they're controlling what you should look at. You know, they're not like the real world where things are kind of all over the place. Uh, entertainment is designed to be in a specific locations. So your path is, is led versus uh, discovered, I guess. It's led to discovery. Okay. I don't know if that even make any sense. But uh, yeah, if you play any kind of open world games, you'll, you'll see roads lead to like great vistas. And in the vista, you'll see your next destination. All that stuff is uh, designed. Okay, let's see here. This this thing here. If I blabber, I'll probably say all sorts of random stuff that doesn't make any sense. Um, so I apologize for anything that doesn't make any sense. Okay, let's see here. Do I want that second layer? It's a little busy, huh? But it's kind of cool looking. What if I try a different color? Let me see. What about pink? But well, it's kind of cool. 
Let's see, bottom is maybe purple, a little bit more purple. I don't, I don't hate this. It's kind of cool. It's very clean right now, but it doesn't matter. I will um, texture it later so it has a little bit of noise in it. I'm going to put this guy in here as well. I think this guy needs to be a little smaller. This could be like some cool holograph, frac, uh, blah, blah, holographic projections, or it could be maybe um, like some kind of sound system. So this part here is going to start reflecting some of the city. Notice I'm spending my time right now in the focal point, right? The background stuff, like the city stuff, that stuff is pretty easy. It's, it's, it's not a high priority right now to focus too much on that. So I'll work on it in a bit here, but what I want to do is get this part realized first. All right, let's get some, these are all people in the front here, it's all people, there's a bus here. Let me lasso some of these, get these things out. Notice I haven't zoomed in at all, right? There's no detail right now. It's just getting the overall picture. We have plenty of time, probably next episode, where we start actually detailing some of these people. And we don't have to detail everything. Uh, we'll get detailed just a little bit. In fact, that reminds me of something I want to show you guys. I don't know if I've actually done it in the previous episodes, but right now it's a good opportunity to actually show that to you guys. Hold on a second as I paint this in. So I'm going to go away from this in a second here and show you guys a little little demonstration of showing detail level on a painting and how you apply for entertainment okay everything i'm talking about here is for entertainment it's not it's not like you go to uh, you go to the louvre in paris and look at some of the master paintings right so the purpose of those paintings are very very different in which the detail level is so high but you know a lot of those paintings takes like a year or half a year to paint them right we're here to do a idea painting, something that's done relatively fast, not super fast, but relatively fast. And the goal of it is to capture the idea. So the approach is a little bit different. All right, let me see here. Let me see if I can open up. Let's go. I think I fogged this too much there. Maybe I fogged a little too much. Let me take that back down a little bit. All right, let me see what it looks like without the grid. Okay, good. So you can see if, um, uh, let's see, that is what I've been adding so far. Well, I kind of lost my little cool geometry. Let's see. I have some pretty cool stuff here, but I sort of lost those. I kind of like that, actually. Let me see what I could do with these. One second here. Maybe I can move this. You know what I could do? I could just put those little thingies elsewhere. Okay, let's do it this way. Boom. Boom. put it here and I'm using this shape right here this kind of um, sign beam thing I'm using that on purpose to block in a perspective grid for you so what I'm doing here is I, I put this shape in okay let me put that in first this will go behind the uh, these geometric forms let's lasso that and then put a little bit of volumetric fog behind it Okay, so that guy sits there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the other side. Let's do another layer. Follow my grid to this line here about this distance and let's make another one on that side. Let me make a better one here. About here. This guy comes down to about this line here, right? So what this does is just a shape, but the, what this shape does is that it, it kind of builds a focal point for you to get your bearings on the perspective, on the camera. So it really helps you set the uh, how you're perceiving the world in what type of lens, right? So because I, I'm creating a grid, you're seeing this line going across. Let me do that again. You're seeing this line going across here, okay? And that's gonna lock your brain, lock your eye to start to understand how this world is being uh, presented to you. So I, I put one here as well. See that this one here, uh, this guy right here. Let me get it higher. That's also showing you that there's a camera here. And then bus is also showing you one, and so is this party car here. I'll do that with the audience a little bit as well. So notice there's some grids going this way. I want to utilize that to give us more 3D space. So what I could do is, for example, I could, uh, let me use my uh, selector thing here. Let me do this on a layer. Okay, I'll just fill in, i just lasso a, uh, a block basically. Of, Fill that in, and I'm going to put this on a grid. 
and this grid will come into perspective. If I could find my hotkey here. Could be like signs, right? You see all this kind of stuff in real cities, like advertising and so forth, which we could turn them into uh, once we uh, start detailing, right? But what this is doing is that it's giving me a, a camera. Okay, they're all about hitting where the horizon line is, so this height is okay. Let me just double check that. Where's my horizon lines? Right about there. Yeah. So these guys are hitting just close to horizon, so I could get away with basically having them almost flat. But I'll erase the top out a little bit. Okay, that's that guy. I need to purge again. Purge memory. Okay. I'll erase these out just a tiny bit. Good enough. Okay. The verticals are not quite right yet, so let's get the vertical in there. Skew. Okay, so that guy's okay. This guy needs to have a little skew as well. Oh, someone mentioned how I got these grids. I actually made these grids a long time ago. It's probably almost 15 years ago since I made them. I made them in 3D Studio Max version one or something. That's like really old version of 3D Studio. Uh, it's not, I don't think even it was called Max back in the days. But anyways, I made it a long time ago by just putting a bunch of cubes and uh, let it render to grid, uh, render wireframe, and that's it. So I just render a bunch of them out and I still use those today. So they're pretty helpful. You can use any 3D software to, to make them like SketchUp and, uh, and you know just render, just do a couple of geometries, use the perspective you want, the uh, ratio you want for the camera, and then just render out to, to wireframe and it'll show up. Okay. So you can see how these ones kind of help set the camera. I'll erase out the bottom of them. Okay, that's Oops, wrong button. Okay, let's check that. As you can see, the uh, the file is getting pretty slow here with Photoshop. Okay, so that gives us a nice camera in the front. Let's merge everybody. Uh, do I still need this guy here? I might be able to use this guy somewhere else. I'll put it up there somewhere and I'll merge the rest. Okay, let's save. Let's save as another version. What? It's not letting me save because it's still saving. Okay, good. Okay, we'll save that as a version four. Okay, I should probably stop the recording just in case it craps out. Let me stop here and we'll continue in a one second here. Okay, we're making a continue our recording here. I just stop it once in a while just in case the video craps out and we don't lose the entire hour of recording here. All right, let's see this guy here. Oh, it also makes the recording a little faster, it seems like, whenever I stop. Okay, this guy, we might be able to use this somewhere. Let's clone it. And what these things do actually, it kind of creates a clean geometry for me, which is quite nice. Let's put it down here. So it's all like loose back, back there, right? But we have this little really clean, oops, wrong button. Really clean geometry, and that's gonna help tighten things up a bit just in the far distance there. Something like that, all right. We'll take them down a bit. Right now they're, they're a little too hot, but uh, I'll just merge them for now. Let's take them down a bit. Okay, let's go back to painting while my computer is nice and fast with a new recording. Let's work on some of this. Let's work on the bus. We should be able to see inside the bus a little bit, it's like people and things. The other side, the glass. Back, some here, driver, bounce light. Oh, right now it's really good. I think in the first about five minutes or so, the computer's super fast before the uh, recording software starts to slow it down. So I'll use the opportunity to just roughly rough stuff in here. People, people, we'll lasso a bunch of people here. Boom, boom, Ooh, wrong lasso. I'll do the uh, freeform lasso. People's heads, some bodies. Some here, let's put some people over there. Cyberpunk world, very messy. Street cars and people share the streets. So. Okay, some more stuff over there, some over there. Okay, that's all lasso to hide that layer and then I'm just gonna blast that with 
airbrush. And we have instant crowd walking around. I was going to show that uh, the uh, a little side thing, but let me see if I have time to get to that. If not, we'll get to it next week it, it, or next episode, I guess. It doesn't matter. It's a pretty quick thing. Because that's more relevant when we start detailing stuff. Right now, we're still not detailing. We're still doing uh, big establishing things. This part of the grid is pretty annoying. Let me erase that out just a little bit. It's too dense. That part of the grid is too dense, so I'm not going to erase that part of the grid out. Uh, this part here as well, where the bus at, so I can see my design. Okay, better. Go back to here. Let's paint some stuff. I kind of like what's going on with the bus here being transparent on the bottom. It's kind of cool. That's a happy accident design right there. So I haven't used any photo textures or anything. We're going to be doing a lot of that later as we clean up. So we'll bring back the photos. We started with a photo. We went back into a line drawing. And then we're going to go back and photo again. So, But this is just one approach. I'll be showing you guys all sorts of ways to do these kind of things. right? There's, there's no really one way to do this. And uh, even someone asked, I think someone mentioned that they, they work in Hollywood now uh, on Marvel films. And there's a lot of 3D. And it's true. In, in LA, especially in LA right now, most of your film design is done on 3D in which you're using Modo and Keyshot and stuff. It's all done that way. My own team uh, do their work that way. For me, I never moved to that because again, I don't, I'm don't. i not a concept artist anymore. I don't need to be that active in terms of using the latest things. Uh, we have designers who are now doing that uh, uh, in the studio, right? So my job really is to art direct the designers. So I don't have to be as active. It's just my job doesn't require me to do so. So of course I know how those things work, but myself, I just do what, I'm, what you guys are seeing here. It's good enough for what I need to do. I still occasionally do some concept art just to show my team sort of uh, the direction or so forth, but I'm not in modo, I'm not modeling stuff, I'm not doing heavy uh, concept art anymore. It's just simply because that's not my job. Uh, not anymore. So if I just got into the industry today, I'll probably be very much into 3D and using uh, all the latest uh, techniques. Just like what we do with our students, we teach them uh, SketchUp and so forth. We don't go as far as teaching them Modo and stuff, but we teach them the foundations of using 3D as a tool, uh, where, which wasn't really around when I was doing design back in the days. But now 3D is very much used for, uh, for design. So... But at the end of the day, uh, having good drawing skills on paper where I could really, uh, what you call it, fluent understanding of Photoshop is still extremely beneficial because uh, oftentimes, sometimes you're working at the director's house or something, and if you could just quickly get something done on paper, it's so helpful. You don't need no 3D, you don't need anything, you know? Because you gotta keep in mind, especially on the film, uh, games, a little bit different, I think, than films, but uh, in terms of uh, movies, the director's goal is to get something on screen. They're, they're worried about the shots, about storytelling. So sometimes a, a quick napkin sketch is good enough for them because they, as long as they, they understand, they, they know how to do the shot. Games are a little bit different because you have to build it out and do a lot of stuff. But sometimes for a film, directors just want to know, hey, how do I get this shot to look good? You know, they just draw like, a really quick sketch on the paper. They're like, okay, I think I know how to shoot that. You know, So uh, it's, it's a little bit different. It's quite fun. A little more, more ad hoc sometimes. Okay, the front of my bus looks kind of dumb. Let me merge some of this. I'll redesign that later. I don't like the way it looks. Maybe I'll do this. Make it more of like a dome thing. It's better. Worry about the detail of it later. Get rid of that. I don't worry about these things too much. I can always call back and uh, mess with them. All right, so the club entrance is here. Let's go back to our club here. So we need an entrance here. All these lights below, all these we bounce lights, very busy here. Zoom out a bit. So now let's merge and then just do a really rough pass. Rough but controlled of designs. We'll use the other lasso too. I'm gonna get a few more buildings to be in front of some of these towers. Come on. Just 
just to break up the space a little bit more, create a little bit more depth. Oh, wrong button, I mean, too much. Let's put a little bit of this. Okay, let's lasso some other interesting shapes here. Just using a lasso tool and uh, getting some geometry in there. That's good. Let's erase out some of these. Get them some, whoop, is that an eraser? What is this? Oh, I see, I see, I have an atmosphere, Never mind. <clears throat> Creating some forms there. Oops, I don't want that. This edge is a little messy right now, so let me clean up that edge. Do, 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 do. A little too hot, but it's okay. We'll put some stuff in front to block that. This shape here is quite weak. Looks like a bunch of uh, thin struts or something of metal so let's fill that in a bit so it's less weak looking okay buildings in the background do, 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 do. boom 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 start to come together yeah, it's starting to look like something at least it's a really big brush right now i'm using just kind of getting all these designs in there so yeah, sometimes I work really loose like this just to get the design out. But detail lasts. Detail is the easy part in a way. I mean, it's not easy, but uh, if you focus too early on details, you could get yourself trapped really early because you're. It's about the commitment. You know, if you commit too early, too fast, sometimes you are stuck in it. You're like, okay, I I spent two hours doing this detail. I don't want to get rid of it, right? So by working a little bit looser, I'm not committed to anything right now. So if I have to get rid of like this, even if I want to get rid of this entire thing here, it's not that big of a deal. The most we lose is like 30 minutes of work. So we can always put it back. But imagine I spend like a whole day modeling the front of it and then getting it to look all nice and then it doesn't look that good as a design or the director is like, oh, I don't like that, you know, and then you waste a lot of time. So I always kind of have the habit of working uh, loose towards the goal and then looking at it as a bigger picture versus the small details and if it feels right, then we go in and detail the crap out of it. Just from my experience, this is a very uh, volatile industry in which nothing is the way it, it seems sometimes. So ideas get changed a lot, budgets get changed a lot. So all sorts of stuff happen like on films. I've been on films where the budget starts out at $150 million and goes down to 50. Um, a few years ago, I was on a film just like that. It was like, I started about 100, I think it was like $120 million budget uh, film. And then they got a star to come in, and the star took about half the budget, and the film became basically fifty million dollars. So all the design had to change because you couldn't realize the designs. You know, designing a hundred fifty or hundred twenty million dollar film versus a fifty million dollar film is quite different in terms of the uh, what you could realize with that money. So that stuff happens, and it's out of your control. So you have to just deal with it and not get frustrated at all. <clears throat> And in this business, also a lot of stuff gets canceled. Games and films, a lot of them die. So you could work on it for, for a while and then it never comes to life. So war games that could be almost done and uh, they cancel it. So just do what you like doing. Uh, you can't get caught up in that kind of stuff. It's out of your control. It's out of my control. Even as a producer, sometimes projects put on hold. Uh, it, go, it goes and money's actually being spent on it. You know, millions of dollars sometimes being spent on things. And it still it kill, gets killed. <clears throat> so. Okay, paint some of this. It's kind of low contrasting here. What's the time? Okay, we're still good. Still got probably like half an hour so I could work on this. I still don't like this bus front. I'm just going to wipe it. So watch what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to like, ooh, it's all gone. Yay. This bus looks kind of dumb. It's too organic. It's not chunky enough. Let's chunk it a bit. Get my lasso. Ooh, I want this lasso. 
no how about this lasso um Boom, boom, boom. Hopefully that works. Sometimes like sh certain shapes just drives you nuts because you're not getting it to look the way you want. Um, and you spend a lot of time trying to clean it up. So I just, I'm gonna chunkify this bus a bit. It's too organic for my liking. If all else fails, we will redesign him. Eh, that's kind of chunky too, huh? Is this on a layer? It's sort of like on a layer. We'll deal with this bus later. I don't want to spend time on them. Okay. Let's do some background stuff. Let's turn the grid off for a second. Just see what the heck we have here. Okay. We have enough um, objects on screen now to paint without grid. So I'll go ahead and do that. Let's do a new layer. Why is nothing showing up? Okay, here we go. You know, maybe I'll get into some very early, uh, show you guys how I textured this stuff up afterwards. We'll see, let me, let me see how far I get with this. So back here is like alleyways and streets and so forth. Let's paint some light back in there. But these are very early concepts. Um, again, I mentioned uh, in our first episode there that this is a little warm-up piece for me to kind of get back in design cinema. So this kind of piece are generally used for just getting the mood, getting some early designs out. But this is solve too many design problems. We'll be doing all sorts of things, hopefully. We'll do some things that are much harder, much tighter designs maybe to solve problems. These ones don't really solve problems. They just kind of give you a look and feel. Uh, but it is important in the early parts of a project to do these. They're generally called establishing blue sky paintings. So they don't make it sometime into the final product or they, they don't make their entirety into the final product, but they do serve a purpose. I mean, every film we're on, you have to do this. So because when the script first gets shown or written, you have to do some type of blue phase, you know, early stage concept design for people on the team to see what this project is all about. So, um, and that's what these come in. It's very tempting for me to go offline and just finish these for you guys, but since we're going to do everything in real time, I will not uh, cut away anything. So you guys will see this from literally the start of this show uh, to the end of this painting, all, all of it recorded. So. Because doing a demo and uh, talking and trying to make it look good is a little tricky, and we have to do these nice and fast within a certain time limit. And with a little bit laggier computer too. Oh, that, my little perspective line, line got record, got uh, stuck in there. It's okay. I still want some kind of geometry here. Maybe we'll put a sphere. I love little spheres. Let's put a sphere. Oh, uh, come on, give me a sphere, okay. Spheres are awesome because they don't distort much. On the side of the lens, they'll distort, but uh, when they're in the center, there's no perspective because it's a sphere. So, um, but only on the edges, they'll distort. Like uh, if you look at a wide lang angle lens of a camera like uh, that shoots a moon, for example, uh, the moon will actually be like an oval on the side of the uh, lens if the lens is wide enough. So, but whenever in the middle, it's, it's cool because you, you can put spheres anywhere as long as it's in the middle of the frame because it doesn't it doesn't have perspective in the sense that it has a grid that it goes to. It has it, but you can't see it because it's a sphere. So you can kind of use it anywhere. Let's see, maybe we'll do this as a darker sphere. I love putting spheres in my cyberpunk stuff. The Luc Besson film has all, all sorts of stuff like this in it. It's like putting the chrome balls from a VFX shot directly into your film. Okay, horizon is above us, so our core is gonna be somewhere about here. And then what I do is I can use the, just like how a film has the chrome balls recording the lighting conditions and the uh, reflection maps, I'm doing the same thing. I'm using this sphere to record local colors that are around and that kind of melts everybody together. City will have all sorts of lights. Okay. 
do 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 do. No, it's not a perfectly reflective sphere, but uh, we'll put some of it like this. Right, some club thing. We'll do some graphic design on the sphere later. See here, put this maybe a little too much, huh? Let me see. Maybe I'll we'll use the sphere elsewhere. We'll use it here. We might use it here, but to put it here, I have to adjust the colors a bit. There's a little baby one there. Get rid of him for now. This guy needs to be darker. We lasso him and uh, fix his reflections a bit. So it faces this way. Get some blue on the top there. Some stuff over here. Yay, a sphere. Okay. Oh, we don't want to block those buildings in the back too much. So we'll show that. They're taking the eye a little bit from the lens here, so I have to probably pull off their highlights a little bit. Let's reduce their highlights down a bit. Let's merge them. Get them some uh, designs on top of them so they're not just pure clean spheres. They have some forms on top. Let's inverse them. Let's go behind. Put a little atmosphere. Okay, I hope this real-time stuff is working for you guys because it's going to be a lot slower to see the final result. It'll probably take another two episodes or so before we get this guy wrapped up to something that's somewhat presentable. But hopefully this one hour, you're seeing quite a bit of a change even from when we first started. So I still don't like this bus. You know what? Let's get rid of it. Boom, 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 boom. Didn't like this design. Let's try into a bit. Let's design this thing out. Let's solve this here so we don't have to deal with it later. Okay. Otherwise, it's such a foreground element. I want to make sure that, oops, that it looks somewhat okay. Okay, it's a little rough. All right, the background stuff is easy to fix. Like the city stuff back there is really simple because it's such uh, background buildings. It's very easy to put back. Where's my grid? All right, because I can always lasso this out. I sort of like where this is going. Get the lasso going here. Cool thing is because these things are these episodes are not that hard to produce if I use real time that you can actually skip ahead if you want on some of these. You know, if you want to go ahead and just skip to the last part to see how much changes there are and then kind of go through in the middle, see if there's any interesting things happening. But whatever it is, I have to stick to this format for a while because it's it's the only way I, it's possible for me to uh, actually keep these design cinemas going. I just can't go back to the editing stuff. It takes way too much time. Okay. Still don't like this bus though. I don't know why. Maybe I just wipe it. Let's see. I could wipe it and replace it with something. 
I don't like what's going on back here either. This building's actually now looking kind of funky. The shape is too generic. Okay, our focal point is still on our nightclub. Let's put some lights back here. Well, too bright. I'm using a little bit of a dodge right now to get this bright level. Just get a high contrast. The bus is nice that it gives me a perspective grid to go off of. But because it's such a foreground element, I have to design him. So uh, I guess we have to do that. Okay, let's design it. Some headlights. It's the windshield. So like the transparent bottom, it's kind of cool. The way I paint is actually very similar to old school way of painting, like gouache paintings and so forth. For those who use gouache before, it's very similar. Photoshop default brush, if you use it, with opacity kind of um, kind of high, you know, like 80, 90 percent, it, it feels like gouache. So. Here. So it feels a little more natural to me, if, especially for those who are transitioning from, uh, from traditional. But I imagine that's pretty low these days. I think most of you guys, your first painting is done in digital uh, versus for me, I didn't get into full digital until about five, six years into my career, maybe more than that. Let me see. I think I went full digital around 2004, somewhere around there. So uh, it's almost 12 years ago, but I started in 97. So that's uh, three times, you know, seven years, seven years without full digital. Okay. Remember what first job, still drawing on uh, paper and markers and so forth. That's, that's what it was back in the days. Wing Commander stuff, actually. Okay. I actually worked on a game that never came out um, as my third job, I guess. Well, st still with Origin slash EA. Uh, we did some Wing Commander stuff, uh, Prophecy and some of those kind of projects. And then uh, we're working on a freelancer project. I mean, a game called Freelancer, but it was not the freelancer one made by Digital Anvil, but a freelancer called Freelancer Online, which was going to be a counterpart to Ultima Online, which was very popular at the time. I think Ultima Online was one of the first highly successful graphical MMOs that came out. Remember, MMOs was very early during that stage. This is 1997, 98, somewhere around there, where MMOs are just starting to appear on the market. I mean, there was no World of Warcraft and things like that. I don't even think EverQuest was out yet at that time. So uh, yeah, so Ultima Online was a very early, uh, two, it was 2D. Um, I think it was 2D, yeah, Ultima Online was like 2D, right? So sprite graphics, I think, um, but it was very successful. So we're doing a 3D follow-up uh, using uh, Freelancer as a, as a base. But at the time, 2000 and, I mean, 1997, the technology just couldn't, keep up you couldn't do it you, you wanted space stations uh, we wanted uh, you know you to board a ship and seamlessly go into your ship and seamlessly go to your uh, you know flying to space and seamlessly land on a planet uh, it was just really hard to do a few years later uh, one game achieved it it was a game that I can't remember what it's called made by Westwood actually and uh, Doug Chang actually designed some of the spaceships and they happened to be able to do seamless loading of a planet by using clouds I believe as a, as a disguise layer so as you go into clouds uh, we'll render a bunch of clouds on the, ca on the camera and then using that opportunity to load the planet so they, have to, they actually pulled it off. I can't remember what the game was called, but the game itself didn't do that well. Uh, but you know, three, four years before that, we're actually trying to do that with Freelancer Online and just wasn't possible. Like Space Station at the time was a few thousand polygons, which today, of course, would be like nothing, but uh, it was just very hard to do. So uh, the game was actually canceled. 
but it was a lot of fun to work on it. You know, we had all sorts of fun stuff you could do in space. Like you could be a pirate, of course. You could just be a junk collector. There's some really good concepts. Like if your ship gets blown up, the, the piece it just stays there in space. So if you have a really expensive spaceship, like your engines or stuff are floating around in, in a sector. So you can actually just be a junkyard guy. Like you, um, you stay on the borders waiting for people to kill each other. And then when they're done, you go back in and you could tow their parts and sell them later. Because if you're a fighter, you couldn't tow someone's engine back with you. They're just floating around in space. So uh, it's really cool. So you could just be a... Any, but of course, if you're towing expensive cargo then somebody else will probably try to rob you for it. So it, it starts to create a player dynamic in which they have to build their own bodyguards and stuff. It's a lot of fun. We have space stations designed, bars, and all sorts of fun stuff. But uh, yeah, just the technology wasn't ready. But they're making that now. I guess Chris Roberts is making that into Star Citizen, which is, sounds very similar. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to adjust the level a bit. This is coming together, you know, for an hour of painting. We have something that's a lot more presentable in terms of the design. Our nightclub is trying to show up, so I think we're getting close to the end of this episode. So what I'll do next week um, is to go in and start detailing. We'll get a, get a few more buildings going in the background. Let me just do a few more so I, I know what I'm going to do next week. Because right. right now it's still very rough, but something is there. It's a little generic, I have to say. This design is not your awesome, you know, uh, cool ideas and so forth. It's a little generic. But again, this is a warm-up piece for me to kind of get back into design cinema. So um, we'll get into fun stuff later. I really want to do some classic game designs. Actually, I loved that, those series when we did them. Like take like old games like, uh, what, like Battle Toast or something, Gradius, you know, like really old games um, that hasn't had a reboot for a long time and we'll design on top of them. So like, have they done new Contras or something? I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do some of that. Maybe we'll do some old films that hasn't been rebooted for a while. It'll be kind of fun, like, I don't know, Never Ending Story or um, Legend or something. You know? And we'll design some stuff off of that. It'll be quite fun. So, but those things require me to be quite warmed up in this series to be able to do them. So this one's going to be a little bit of a generic city. But I think it's good for you guys to see how this stuff comes together anyways. I do these to sort of relax my, my mind sometimes when I'm on production. These are some of kind of brainless design work. It's just fun. They're not exactly the most difficult, but they're a little bit, little bit designed, so they're not exactly generic either, so they're kind of fun. This is a, a few steps above Spiky Mountains, you know, but it's not that far removed from Spiky Mountains. Where's my grid? Do do, do, do. But recording the second episode, I'm already a lot more relaxed than uh, the first one. It's not the nervousness, it's just kind of getting used to the lag. Um, even on a very powerful PC when you're recording in Photoshop, it tends to have a micro delay. It's less than a second, but you definitely feel it when doing these, and uh, it's kind of distracting. I'll see if the new PC I ordered uh, is much faster. Because there's a difference between working in real time and working with a tiny bit of a lag. Like, you know, when I shift my screen left and right, it's, it, it has a hard time following. And that actually gets in the way of design. But we don't complain. In this business, you don't complain. You have to just do the work. So uh, you, don't, you don't complain about anything. The less you complain, the probably better you'll be in this business. Because... If you think about it from a, what we do as a, you know, especially if you're still a concept artist, right? If you're working as a concept artist, your job is just one of many things that people are involved. On a video game or a film, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people working on these things. Um, imagine if everyone complained about something, you know, nothing would get done. So you just bite your tongue, you know, you could get onto sets where the, the equipment they give you. I remember working on Star Wars, uh, and uh, this is back in the days, not, not the new Star Wars, but uh, back in the days, and they'll give you these leftover computers from IOM uh, that they're not using anymore as render farms, right? So they're like these decrepit old machine that's been rendering, you know, port or CPUs like probably on the last uh, mile of their life. Uh, and that's what they give the art department. They're like, oh, we don't need these computers anymore, so uh, you guys use it as, a, as an art department tool. And they're laggy, and they're like, they, they, they crash a lot, uh, all sorts of technical problems. But you can't be like, oh, we need new computers. The, no one cares. It's like, dude, that's what you use to design these big IPs off of, and that's what you do. So uh, I've been used to it. I've been uh, in every situation that has problems. So you just get used to it. You don't, you don't complain. 
you do the best work, and if you do the best work, you will get rewarded for it because you solve problems versus creating them. So, this thing I'm actually liking now, that's the front. I have to adjust this a little bit. Kind of a, it looks like that guy from uh, Day of the Tentacles, for some reason, reminds me of the squid character. I've been in art departments where um, you sit down and they put you right underneath the AC unit. So you have a huge humming fan like you know, all day on top of you blowing ice cold wind down on you. you know? And that's the only position they have in the art department at that point. So you go through all sorts of stuff. You can't, this is the pre-Twitter days. You, know, you couldn't go on Twitter or something and go, oh, my art department sucks or something. You just, you just bear with it and just do the work. Okay. Right now, like, we're shooting one film that's just, it's shooting at night, and it's freezing cold. It's, like, below, um, I think it's about negative 10 degrees. And uh, at least I could get to wear a jacket because I'm not in the film. But uh, a few nights ago, we had all these extras, about 150 extras, and uh, they have to wear, like, dresses and T-shirts and stuff. I can only imagine. But you can't complain. You complain, you're off the set, you know. It's a grueling business sometimes. You look at these people, they're like, they're like trembling. And then as soon as you call action, they have to act like they're having fun and walking around. But I know they're freezing in negative 10, wearing, a, wearing like a short skirt or something. Uh, just totally crazy. I was freezing. I'm wearing like double jackets and thermos and all sorts of stuff. Okay. All right, I think this one's pretty good for today. I'm pretty happy where this is at. We could definitely get this to a very good state next week. I'm not happy with the overall proportions yet. Uh, before I end this, let me see if I can adjust a little bit. I think this thing could be bigger to just draw your attention. Let me take a really quick stab at that. Let me see. Okay, I'm going to take that. I'm going to paste it. So I have this guy on a layer right now. Okay. And I'm just going to make it maybe 20 or 30% bigger. I just want to see what it looks like. Okay, that's not in grid right now, so I'm going to put that into a grid. Maybe that makes it more epic. I sort of dig that. Let me just look at it in reverse. It's about a 30% increase in size. Oops, wrong one. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I think I'm going to keep that. I'm going to keep this scale. Because right now, you can see it's still in the rough stage that even if I scale this up, you don't notice any problems. So, um, and it's in grid. It's off by just a tiny bit. Let me uh, adjust that. And then what we do is we'll pick up next, next episode and, and start detailing. Let me just fix this perspective real quick. It's off just, just a tiny bit. Okay, we're about good here. Top of the heart is good. Okay, that's, that should fix it. Verticals are good. Okay, good. I think it's make it a little grander. That becomes that looks more like an entrance to a, a something, you know, nightclub, uh, a entrance to a mall or something, right? But that's that's our goal is to attach your attention. Uh, yeah, I think this looks pretty good. I'm pretty happy where this is at. I think this is uh, perfect, ready for doing details. My my floor here is a little warpy. I'm just going to go ahead and merge that and save as another version. Let's save as V5. What I mean by warpy is right here. It's creating a, like a loop, like a little like, like this. So uh, let's we need to punch that up by maybe bringing... We could put a couple of robots here, maybe some droids. Cyberpunk always has cool like little robots walking around. Let me see. We need a guy here. Maybe a guy here. And another weird guy here. I'm just going to rough those guys in real quick. I don't even know what they are. They're something to hold my form. I need these here to get my grid to be less wobbly. Do, 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 do. We'll make him do like little droids. Do that next week. So they're walking along with people.
Yeah, that's good. All right, I better stop this before we start to become like a two-hour episode and you guys be bored out of your mind. So, uh, all right, I think this is uh, at a pretty good state here. So what we'll do is uh, maybe I could get back, uh, maybe even this Friday or something, record the next one and finish this up in the next. I think it'll take another two episodes to finish this up. But until then, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in uh, part three. All right, see you guys.